Good evening. Glad to see each of you here this evening for this midweek uh, Bible study here at Ephesus. And if you're viewing online, we welcome you also. And uh, glad to have you all with us. Uh, we're studying in the Old Testament the uh, characters of the Old Testament. And tonight, we're going to be studying about e uh, Elijah. Elijah was one of the great prophets in the, in the Old Testament uh, of Israel. Uh, if you remember last week, we uh, talked a little bit about uh, the divided kingdom, when the divided kingdom started, and uh, the kingdom of Israel uh, was in the northern part of the country, and the, the kingdom of uh, Judah was in the southern part of, of, of the country. And uh, most of the kings of Israel and Judah said that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. There was very few of them that followed the Lord. You remember we talked about Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man uh, in the world and probably the richest man in the world has ever been. And God gave him wisdom. And in the beginning of his rule, he was uh, loyal and faithful to God. But later on, as he grew older, it says that he had 600 wives and, and uh, two or 300 concubines, I think. And it says that his wives turned him away from God. And in his late, later life, even Solomon began to worship the idols that his wives had brought into the country when the, they came into him. So uh, that can be a lesson to all, to all of us today is no matter what part of our life we're in, whether we're 20 year old, 40, 60, 90, or whatever, we need to always strive our best to, to be faithful to God in whatever age and condition we may be in. And this, the lesson tonight about Elijah and uh, the king at that time was uh, uh, King uh, Ahab. Ahab was reigning over uh, Israel at this time. And his wife, you, do you remember who Ahab's wife was? Jezebel. And she's one of the most evil queens, I guess she was a queen since he was a king, that, that has ever been, seemed like. And uh, they, they all worship idols at that time. Uh, Uh, they worshipped uh, the idol of idol of Baal and uh, the idols of uh, Asheroth, A S H E R A H, Asheroth. And chapter 17 of First Kings is where we're going to start tonight. First Kings 17 it says, "And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab." As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook, brook Cherub, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went, talking about uh, uh, Elijah, he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he had stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook, drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So even this brook that flowed into the river Jordan dried up. And this next uh, section, uh, beginning in verse 8, talks about Elijah and the widow. Uh, and the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. 
I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So Elijah goes down to this place and, and he finds this widow there. And uh, he tells this widow, says, uh, Give me a, please bring me a cup of water uh, that I may drink. And I also told her to bring him a morsel of bread. And she told him, he says, well, I only have one bin of flour left and one little jar of oil is all I got. And I'm fixing to prepare that for, for me and my family, me and my son, and after that, we're just going to die. So they, they apparently was in real bad condition of uh, uh, being without food and water because of the great drought. But she said, as you say, I'll, I'll go and fix, fix you some bread and, and water. So she did. And it says that that bin of flour after she had already cooked it and the oil, it was the same, stayed the same. So Elijah came into her house and it don't, I don't think it says how long he stayed there, but it said as long as he stayed there, she cooked him bread and gave, and gave him water, but the bin of flowers was still the same every time. The same was in, in the jar of, of oil the same time. It stayed the same no matter how much she used. Going down to verse 17. Now it happened after these saying that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so, ve so severe that there was no breath left him in. So it seems that the, the younger son, son had died. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you came to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her, hand, out of her arms and carried him up to the upper room where he was staying and lay him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is the truth. A yeah, real uh, emotional thing right here for, for the son of this woman that had been providing for Elijah died. And Elijah took him in and uh, prayed to God and through God's help, the son was revived. Any questions or comments on anything? Feel free to make any comment or ask any questions if you have any. Okay, chapter 18 uh, says Elijah's message to Ahab. Now, uh, Ahab had 400 prophets, the prophets of Baal, and uh, they worshiped Baal. And uh, Elijah said, well, well let's, let's just have this test do this test and see who, who's, who's really God. And uh, so Elijah told him to build this altar. 
and each one of them built an altar. And uh, they gave these 400 prophets of Baal uh, a bull. They told him to, to slay that bull and put him on the altar and then call on your God, your gods, to come down and, 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 uh, with fire and uh, burn that sacrifice up. So these prophets of Baal, they went and built their altar and, and uh, slayed the bull and put him on the altar. And they, be, they began to uh, call on, uh, on their, their uh, gods, their idols that they were, were worshiping. And they said, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped about the altar and they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry out louder, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he may be on a journey, or perhaps he's even sleeping and, and must be awakened. Verse 28, So they cried louder and cut themselves with, with, so, with knives and lances, until the gut blood gushed out of them. Well, it seemed like that was one of the things that the, the uh, idol worshiper would do sometimes is they, they had even cut themselves during their, their worship. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice and no answer, and no one paid attention. And beginning in verse 30, Elijah builds his altar and he uh, slays the bull and, and puts the bull upon the altar. And he tells him there, uh, he, put a, he dug a trench around the altar and he told the, the people there, he says, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said a second time, do it again. Put more water on it. And he told them a third time, put more water on it. So verse 35, so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned, turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, The Lord, God, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. So... All these prophets of Baal were executed there by, by Elijah. Beginning in verse 41, uh, this last part of chapter 18 here, says the drought ends. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is, is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went to the top of, of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. So Elijah sent his servant seven times to go look at the sea. But he said each time he didn't see anything. And verse 44, then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud 
as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stop you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So the, the drought had ended there after, after uh, uh, Elijah had uh, slain all of these uh, false prophets, these prophets of Baal. And chapter 19 uh, tells how that Elijah escapes, escapes from uh, Jezebel, the wife of, of Ahab. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger out to, to Elijah. So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself, talking about Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by the head was a cake of bread baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. So he went out in the strength of that food Forty days and forty nights to Horab, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. Now here is another great miracle, isn't it? Elijah went forty days and forty nights without eating and drinking, it seems. Who else did that? Jesus, wasn't it, when, when the, he was sent out in the wilderness and tempted by the devil, went without food and water. And the, that's the only way that he could have lived. It, it, had, it was a miracle of God. Because we can't, our physical bodies can't go 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. In fact, uh, I, I don't think of a body can probably go a, a week without water. And beginning in verse 11 of chapter 19, uh, God, uh, God's revelation to Elijah. You know, Elijah is really in a downhearted position now, in a sad condition. He thinks he's the only one left that's serving God. But God appears to Elijah, and he says, uh, in the cave, and, and God asks Elijah, says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous, verse 14, very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. And you shall anoint Jeru, the son of Nisha, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shabbat, uh, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. 
It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jeru will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jeru, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth has not kissed him. So Elijah wasn't the only one that was still faithful to God, was he? God said, I've still got 7,000 people here that's, that's being faithful to me and haven't bowed to the, the Baal. And the last part of, of uh, chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 19, uh, tells how that Elijah comes and calls uh, Elisha to follow him. And it says Elisha was out in the field plowing, and he had uh, 12 yokes of oxen pulling his plow. And uh, Elijah told, so Elisha says, you come follow me. He says, well, I need to go back uh, and, and tell uh, to kiss my father and mother, and then I'll follow you. And said after he'd done that, he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Any questions or comments on anything? This next chapter, uh, 20 of Kings, uh, tells how that Ahab defeats the Syrians. And going right down to verse uh, 23 of, of chapter 20, uh, as uh, the Syrians are again defeated. In, in verse 31, uh, Ahab here, uh, his servant said to him, Look now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us put sackcloth around our waists and ropes around our heads and he go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So they wore sackcloths around their waist and put robes on their head and came to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. And he said, Is he still alive? And he is my brother. Now the men were watching closely to see whether any sign of mercy would come to them. And he told him, says, Your brother Ben-Hab, go bring him here. Then Ben-Hadon came out, of, out to him, that he had came down up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadon said to him, The cities which my father took from your father I will restore, and you may set up marketplaces for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. And Ahab said, I will send you away with this treaty. So he made a treaty with him and sent him away. And beginning in verse 35, it said, says Ahab is condemned. Now a certain man of the sons of the prophet said to his neighbor, by the word of the Lord, strike me, please. And the man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, Because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, surely as soon as you part from me, a lion shall kill you. And as soon as he left him, a lion found him and killed him. And he found another man and said, Strike me, please. So the man struck him, inflicting a wound. Then the prophet departed, and waited for the king by the road, and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. Now as the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle, and there a man came and, 
and came over and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. If by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. While your servant was busy there, uh, here and there, he, he was gone. Then the king of Israel said to him, So shall your judgment be. You yourself had decided it. And he hastened to take the bandage away from his eyes. The king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life, and the people for his people. So the king of Israel went to his house sullen and displeased and, 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 displeased and came to Samaria. And in chapter 21, it says, Naboth is murdered for his vineyard. Uh, King Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because in this year and next to my house. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you inheritance of my father to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word that Naboth and Jezreel had spoken to him. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Why is your spirit sullen and that you eat no food? And he said, Because I spake to Naboth the Jezreel and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else it ple if it please you, I will give you another vineyard. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreel. And she wrote letters to Ahab in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and, and the nobles who were dwelling in the city of Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king, then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men went out and proclaimed a fast and seated Nabob with the high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Nabob in the presence of the people, saying, Nabob has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was when Ahab heard this Naboth was dead, and Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreel. Well, that, that was a pretty uh, cruel thing to do to your neighbor, wasn't it? Just asked him for, for his garden, and he told him, oh, this, this is the garden of my father. I can't give it to you. And it made uh, Ahab so mad that uh, he, he just wouldn't eat. He just sold up. And, and Jezebel, his wife, said, you, you come on and eat. I'll, t I'll take care of it. So she come up with this plan that that, uh, that uh, Naboth would uh, blaspheme God, as the scandals had said. And they took him out and stoned him to death. In the last part of chapter 21 of 1 Kings, 
And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your prosperity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bound and free. In verse 22, I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebuch, and like the house of Bashib, the son of Ajah, because of the provocation which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. So God's going to bring vengeance upon Ahab and his wife Jezebel for what they had done. In so it was so when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishabite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. So here, it seems that Ahab had a change of heart, a change of mind. And, and God said that because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring this calamity in his days, but in the days of his son. And I think we'll stop right there and begin with chapter 22, the Lord willing, next week. Thank you very much.
ask Brother Adam if he would lead us in our prayer. sick of our number, help the ones that are in quarantine, help the ones that have the COVID, help the ones that struggle in day-to-day walk, walks of life, and please just heal them to be your will. Father, we pray for the ones that lost loved ones, that you will comfort them in a way that only you can. Be with us as Christians that we can let our light shine each and every day. Go with this God, guard, and direct us, and keep us safe. And in the end, when we're found faithful, we'll home with you in heaven. Amen. Well, good evening. We are certainly glad to that we have the opportunity to come together on this midweek Bible study, and we get to see each other and be with each other and worship God, and and hopefully learn a portion from His Word. I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, extend the invitation. I want to wish you all a, uh, a Merry Christmas. As you can tell, I'm very festive. Uh, could be for the festivus for the rest of us, because uh, that's today. But uh, we're, we're glad you are all here and hope you all do well. One of the best things and my favorite thing uh, to do uh, around this time of year is to get the mail every day. Uh, and, and to see what's lurking or lying in the, in the box before us. And it can be very exciting. It can be very intimidating. Uh, but more often than not, I'm just, uh, I get real excited and real happy to open up the mailbox and get an envelope out and to get a Christmas card. And that, it's always pretty neat. It's always pretty cool. A lot of them, they come from several of you here, and we're grateful for that. And they also come from... Uh, people, maybe family that you don't see very often. Maybe you get, uh, you have some uh, aunts or uncles or cousins, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's even a, a child or your mom and dad. Maybe they live out of state and you don't get to see each other, and you haven't got to see each other uh, this year uh, for uh, quarantining reasons, and so you've been trying to keep your distance away. But you open up that mailbox and you get a card out, you get a letter out, and you open that up and. Uh, you, you take it straight into the house and you open it up and try to get glitter everywhere because uh, your wife enjoys uh, getting all that glitter up out of the floor. Uh, but we, we open up these cards and we read them and we read what these people will have to say. And maybe, it's, maybe it's just simply, uh, simple as Merry Christmas or maybe they're words of affirmation and words of praise and appreciation uh, to you. Uh, but, but I've never gotten one. And now that I've said this, somebody will send me one just to be funny. Uh, I've never gotten one that, that's uh, Merry Christmas, we hate you, uh, it, or anything like that, or Merry Christmas, you need to improve on uh, your presentation, you need to be more, uh, we don't like your Christmas decorations, or we, don't, we want you to change this, this, or this. Uh, but I, I wonder that as we read through the book of Revelation, and we read about what Christ had John say to the churches, and what, what was being said to each church? And I wonder what it was like to open up that letter and to receive words that you've messed up. Uh, you've missed the mark. You haven't been doing things with the right attitude, with the right persona. You haven't been doing things in the right way. And oftentimes I think about what, what if, we think about that as a, as a church letter, and, it, and in fact it was, but what if uh, Jesus was to write you a letter and you were to go out to your mailbox tomorrow or this evening if your mail runs late and you were to open up that mailbox and you were to get that letter out, what would, what would Christ be saying to you? Would it be all words of, of praise and good job? Would it be words of you've left your first love? Would it be words of your heart's not in it anymore? What would your letter say? Well, this is a beautiful opportunity and a great time for us all to have together that we can change maybe what those words that letter might say. 
that if you're here this evening and you're not a Christian, uh, as a matter of fact, you, right now you don't even have a, a lamp. You don't even have a lamp stand. You don't even have a candle lit. Uh, you have an opportunity to become a child of God. And maybe you're here this evening and, and you need to have uh, prayers of the church and you need encouragement and you need to correct some things in your life that say, hey, I, I, I've got problems and I want to correct this. That's what all these letters were for. That's what these letters were written for to these churches. Uh, well, at least six of the seven were all things that you need to correct this before it's too late. And now is the opportunity for us, if we were to open up our letter, for us to correct the things that we need to correct before it's too late. If you're here this evening and you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. We had 32 here tonight, and as mentioned earlier, we are glad that you all are here. And we have uh, some joining us online, and we're grateful for you tuning in as well. We need to remember those who are sick and those who are shut in, those who are staying in uh, for safety reasons, and we want to pray for them and remember them and uh, give them a call, give them a card, send them a text, an email, uh, let them know that, that we love them. Uh, are there any announcements that need to be made at this time? We'll meet again, on Lord willing, on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And we would love for you all to be here once again and to come and be with us in our worship service. Uh, of course, it will also be available uh, online through the live stream. If there's nothing else, Brother Bruce Nelson will lead us in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, as we enter into the next coming days, please give us a joyful love and a thankful heart. Please help us enjoy fellowship with our families. Be with the sick and shut in tonight. Please help them get back their most wanted need of help would be thy will. As we separate, please go with us. God, guard, and direct us. And in the end, we've been found faithful. Give us home with thee in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>